This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. I'm Dave Dewar. I'm the development director for the University Library, and uh, both Vikram and Melanie are off handling parental duties at this point. But uh, as uh, Joyce Carol Oates announced last month, uh, we're still celebrating the fact that Vikram uh, had uh, been named a Guggenheim, uh, with a Guggenheim this year, which uh, is, is quite a remarkable thing here at Cal. So we will follow his progress with interest, and he and Melanie will be back hosting in uh, the uh, fall. So uh, I would like to, we have uh, one participant who also was going to read it at uh, the uh, Lunch Poems event who could not make it because of a last minute emergency. I'd still like to acknowledge her. Lily Berger is, uh, was a, is a junior who's majoring in English. She's the recipient of the English department's Yoshiko Uchida prize in writing for fall of 2014, as well as this semester's winner of the Julia Keith Shrout Short Story Prize. And she states, writing is where my home is. I don't know if that's grammatical, but it sounds very evocative anyway. So we would like to congratulate Lily, even though she can't be with us. I would now like to introduce James Lewis. He is a third year English and theater major here at Berkeley a dedicated actor in the theater community, and is excited to have the opportunity to branch out creatively into the writing scene. When he isn't acting, cooking, or napping, a popular pursuit in this room, I will tell you, he enjoys writing poetry and stories with unlikable protagonists, James. Thank you so much. Uh, I just want to take a quick moment just to thank all the organizers of Story Hour. Uh, it's really a special opportunity to be able to come here and read. Uh, but without further ado, I'm going to be reading uh, from a story called The White Falcon. Uh, it was for a class I had this semester with Melanie. <clears throat> Shaheen despised the idea of carrying two sun protectors in the car more than any idea he had ever heard of. It wasn't because it was uncool, it was, or because it was unnecessary, the sun only comes from one direction at a time, after all, or because they took up so much space in the back seat. It's the principle of it all, he texted to his fiance on his way home from work, with the offending foil monstrosities riding shotgun next to him. His stomach had started grumbling right on cue, two blocks from their Glencoe Tudor. As he pulled into the driveway, he saw her reply. You mean principle, dear, L-E. Her capitalization was perfect, her punctuation precise. Shaheen almost snapped his key off in the ignition. She must have heard the garage door open, but she had sent the text anyway to correct him. Bad enough she knew he wasn't foreign, but still insisted on correcting his English. She was almost as bad as Miss Mulligan, the sixth grade teacher who had taken it into her head that he was from Iran. Back then, he only knew it as Persia from history lessons and had brought him dates on Fridays and always corrected his English like he needed the help. You would think with a name like Anna Maria, his fiance would have had similar problems, but apparently not. She was a gem. She was intelligent, though not so great at parking as all that, he noticed as he passed her blue Camry in the garage. Anna Maria hadn't gotten dinner. She wanted to go out, apparently. Come on, isn't it a Friday night, dear? She asked him, but it somehow didn't really sound like a question. Shaheen placed his keys on the end table by the door as carefully as he could manage. She had been sitting here waiting for him, texting about those idiotic sun protectors his entire drive home. He just wanted something to eat. She was sitting on the couch, her feet up on the leather. He looked away from her, walked into the kitchen instead. Of course, darling, 
Whatever you want to do, I'm sure we'll end up doing. He didn't look to see her reaction, choosing to plow ahead instead as he reached up into a cabinet for some glasses. How about an apartif before we go? I'm starving, so it shouldn't take much, he added, turning around now with two wine glasses in hand, smiling a big smile. Anna Maria was sitting on the couch, looking at something outside the window. He couldn't see what, and he didn't particularly care. Red okay? He didn't wait for an answer, nor did he expect one, as he was already opening a bottle of Pinot. By the time he had poured the drinks and come down to sit next to her on the large leather recliner, she was still looking out the window. I'm wondering if we should have gotten the Maxima. What? Darling, the Ultima is perfect, trust me. Or at least it would be if it wasn't filled with sun protectors. <laughs> Shaheen forced out a small laugh here. The last thing he wanted was to have to go back to that damn dealership. The first salesman he had talked to had tried to tell them about how the Ultima was perfect for Islamic families. <laughs> While Shaheen had taken offense at the assumption, Anna Maria had been more bothered by the incorrect use of the term. She was sure it should have been Muslim families. I've just been thinking that the Maxima has a bit better gas mileage. I know it doesn't really matter for us financially right now, but I'm thinking more about the kind of example we'll be setting for our kids. I mean, she trailed off, seeming unsure of what to say. They hadn't had many discussions about children, and the few they'd had had been quite brief. Shaheen sipped his wine and didn't look at his fiance. He thought about trying to rescue her. I mean it about the sun protectors. I'm never going to use either one of them, really. We got the leather so we wouldn't have to worry about sun damage or anything like that. And I'll be the one driving it more for now anyway, as long as you have the Camry. If it's really going to be our car, I think I should have some say in the matter. She looked at him, and the look on her face reminded him instantly of Miss Mulligan, like he was speaking another language. Even though he knew everything he was saying made perfect sense. His wine was almost finished, so he poured himself another glass. Some say? As if you wouldn't... Besides, he said, feeling like the wine pouring into his glass. The sun only comes from one direction at a time, so I'm thinking about changing my name back. Shaheen almost spilled the pinot. He tried and failed to collect himself. What? Just until the official wedding, I mean. I just think it would be a little more, well... Traditional? Traditional. Yes. All right. Shaheen sipped his wine. Twice more he drank, and then he finished off the glass. He didn't pour another. I'm taking the sun protectors out tomorrow morning. Thank you. Next up will be Donna Griggs. She's a senior undergraduate studying English and graduating this May. She grew up in San Luis Obispo on the gorgeous central coast of California, and she'll be entering the MFA program in creative writing and poetics at the University of Washington this upcoming fall. Donna Griggs. I would also like to say thank you for the opportunity to be here. Uh, my piece is entitled, A Single Lesbian, Seven Steps to Gay Days, An Adventure with Babies, Bananas, and a Monkey. Whether you're gay or straight, gay days at Disneyland is truly one of the best activities one can experience in their life. There are pool gatherings and dance parties, group boat rides and ice cream socials. Just the opportunity to watch a 250 pound man resembling a lumberjack almost coming to tears when he's able to hug Mickey Mouse is well worth the price of admission. I think that most gay people would say that the optimum scenario for attending such an exciting event would be to go with your significant other, perhaps with the kids, or even single with a bunch of your favorite pals but I think they're selling the straight population a little short. Going against the grain, I made the unconventional choice of asking my younger sister, straight, and her two boys, Christopher, a three-year-old toddler, 
and Jackson, an infant just four months old, to join me on my adventure. Not only was my first gay days memorable, but I was able to take away from it a few indispensable nuggets of wisdom. Number one, supervision. Make sure you know where the monkey and its tail is at all times. What's the monkey? It's that hideous looking backpack in the shape of an animal that has a detachable tail. I know what you're thinking and I've said it to myself a million times. What a horrible contraption. I would never make my kid wear that. That way of thinking lasted about five minutes after we entered the park when my three-year-old nephew spotted Goofy and made a break for it. After catching up with the sprinting tyke, I looked at my sister and said, okay, give me the fucking monkey. <laughs> it will become your best friend because you know what's worse than people giving you dirty looks for fastening the cub with something that resembles a dog leash so that you don't lose your kid? Actually losing your kid. Enjoyment. I love amusement park rides, roller coasters, water rides, carousels. But here's the thing. You're not on your time, you're on kid time. You will inevitably end up doing and seeing everything that the little one wants. It can be a little unnerving at first, but I guarantee the first time you see them do something cute that makes you laugh, all you'll want to do is follow them around the park. While getting on Pirates of the Caribbean, my three-year-old nephew walked up straight up to the attendant, helping us into the boat pointed at her and yelled, you're a scurvy dog. She was taken aback a tad, but the rest of us sure enjoyed it. <laughs> Number three, food. This one is a bit tricky, but enormously important. First, the good news. Kid meals at the big D land are relatively inexpensive, and three-year-olds don't eat that much. You could give them three bites of a cheese quesadilla and some chocolate milk, and they're ready to run a marathon. However, the bad news is that the fuel tank of said rugrat dips below a certain point, they become the devil incarnate. At one point, while the three-year-old's head was spinning around, I was forced to push my way to the front of a fruit stand line to retrieve a banana. Now, of course, there was some grumbling by the other patrons, to which I replied, you see that demon spawn over there? <laughs> if I don't shove a banana in his mouth pronto, then we're all going to suffer. After witnessing the meltdown firsthand, they were very obliging. So remember, pack snacks, a lot of them. Number four, sleep. Now I love a good party as much as the next homosexual. And I realized that the thumpa thumper from the hotel next year is can be pretty tempting. However, remember that there's a reason why it's 9.30 p.m. and you're in your room already, feet throbbing, looking into the mirror and wondering why it looks as if you got your ass kicked by an angry hairdresser. You can't let the kids get the drop on you. You have to be ready. So get plenty of sleep, unless you want to end up the following night with a pulled muscle and Cheerios in your hair. Number five, the infant. Oh, they're cute, cuddly, and smell nice when the day starts out. But beware, this can be extremely misleading. First and foremost, if the wee one is asleep, do not, under any circumstances, disturb its slumber. Trust me, you want this one as nocturnal as possible. Taking one kid to Disneyland is tough enough. Taking two can, in extreme circumstances, cause psychosis. Secondly, sudden attacks of projectile vomit will occur without warning. The little one could actually be smiling and showing absolutely no signs of distress beforehand, so stay alert. Side note, said baby should not be swung around after dining a, downing a sizable amount of breast milk. Number six, sex. You would think that a lesbian's attendance at an event such as gay days would facilitate a certain amount of opportunities in the hookup arena. Under normal circumstances, this is a distinct possibility. However, with sister and nephews in tow, all wearing matching shirts with baby barf on them, it puts a small kink in the mojo department. So if you would like your gay days to abound with sexual proclivities, then I highly suggest that you go with your single friends would be more than happy to ply you with alcohol and be your wing women. Number seven, getting all that you can out of your experience. Now with all those helpful hints in mind, I've, less, I've left the best and most important tip for last. The most valuable commodity to have on any trip is a partner in crime. Whether it's a quick day trip to the beach or a week-long extravaganza to the happiest place on earth, make your travel companion decision wisely. Make sure they are dependable, knowledgeable, and above all, have a great sense of humor. 
If you follow these effective seven steps, your gay days, or really any adventure, will certainly be an experience you won't forget. Case in point, on the first day at the park, I was certain that I had made the right choice in my partner in crime. With the gates open mere moments, we approached a bench where two young women were sitting. My sister Stephanie parked the stroller with her four-month-old angel sleeping sadly aside, looked directly at the women and said, hi, we're gonna go ride that train right there. Is it okay if I leave him here with you? <laughs> with the sun shining and the look of terror on those young girls' faces, I knew it was gonna be a good trip. Thank you. Next up is Andrew David King. <laughs> Andrew is a philosophy and English major who will be graduating this month, despite his best efforts to avoid it. <laughs> and there truly have been many efforts to avoid it. Um, I just want to first say thanks to Gigi and everyone else who puts this thing together. It's really awesome. And second, I wanted to apologize for bucking the trend of funny, uplifting, witty stories. But I think given the depressive reputation of writers in general, we can all agree that it was b bound to happen. <clears throat> this is a piece called Fennel Park. The day the man lied down in the field, he did not arrive in a red pickup like the witness said. He did not head northbound. He did not stand near the outcropping on the easternmost limit. He did not thrust his hands out against a storm as black brown as tea before it is too bitter to take. That, they concluded, was someone else. The unknown did not drive a gray truck but walked. With empty pockets, with no boots or socks, they were dirty and it seemed pointless to wash them. Without sound except for the back and forth argument of his feet until the angles of the playground slid out of the early morning haze. It could have been a dream that led him, he thought. That was plausible. The walls between sight and knowledge and memory and revelation were not walls, after all, but chain-link fences, spilling the mist of whatever meaning they could hold. So it was that the patch where he chose to lie down was but another anteroom to pace, another chamber and a never-finished hive, a square patch of matted-down grass about seven feet across. Near the square grew a clump of trees thronged with parasitic vine, that reminded him of the hair of the woman who had once lived at the house he had walked here from. It did not snake in the wind like hair, but neither did hers now. Neither did the hair of anyone else who slept under the earth. He lied down. The cumulus roared into a menagerie, a rhinoceros and then a termite unfolding its shell wings into an eagle. He wondered at the horizontal rain of pollen, how each packet blindly beelined toward the pistils of the calla lilies or toward the gravel. Could he taste them? He opened his mouth. He could. It was a small taste, and it was sour, one saliva after a long sleep, the bottom of juice that has settled. It was the second to last thing he would taste before the flavor of his own skin drowned in the white noise of hunger, before the air and the exhaust and the pollen became like how the bark of a tree feels to a tree, a thing that had never been otherwise. By the weekend of the birthday party, the vines had taken gentle shoots to his wrists, leaving room for his pulse the way a knot halts before constriction. Thickets of brown overtook his chest. Sparrows the size and shape of pears brushed his face. Neighbors had already begun to complain about the ash that wept from his abandoned house. Reticula of it laced their windshields, their white tulips, their plaster. Later, the police would break in to find the house empty, a fireplace overflowing with cinders, ash trails and the impressions of bare feet leading everywhere, gray garlands to the kitchen, to the bedroom, and at least one ophidian loop that exited the front door only to return through it. Later, after the uproar, they would swarm the woods, a dark-clad army. They would find him, but they could not detain him, the only evidence of their frustration being a pair of handcuffs left dangling from a trunk. Before all this, though, the birthday boy had fled his party to wander, as those who see the end of a parade coming sometimes avoid it. The man could not notice the boy's family or their occasional awkward laughter, nor how garish their red balloons and all the plastic petals each left in its wake when it burst. But when the boy cupped the man's ear and spoke into it, his last human ounce listened. What do you see? 
This was a question the way the destruction of a painted canvas was a question, not a letter slipped under a door, but a pick snarling in the guts of a lock. The man's heartbeat stirred and the vines, those good parents, tightened. He hoped that if he stayed silent, the boy would disappear, would take him for a mirage. He had escaped notice up until now and thought he might escape it again. His sarcophagus stood in public, but no more so and no less so than a boulder or a lightning charred stump or any other uninterestingly real feature of the landscape, real in its refusal of the clockwork of thought, that clockwork unknown to a world of roots and rain, which had begun again to clank in the pool of the man's skull. When the boy climbed atop the gnarl of roots that was the man's chest and matched their eyes each to each, the man knew he had to respond. And so he did. The boy left. The day stumbled forward. Acorns unfastened from a dry branch. The man's senses electrified, but his limbs were locked. No part of the mass gave way. He would sleep soon, but for now he watched the pollen lacerate the blue and he could taste the tang as it seared his tongue, when like the befuddlement of things as they fluttered from solids to soil. He knew it was ash, but the word for it had been wiped from him. A rhizome, it had crawled out into oblivion, not unlike his body, not unlike the air in a balloon as it acquaints itself with a thorn. Thanks. I told you it wasn't funny, um, not on purpose. Uh, our next reader is Alexander, Alexandra Coppell, who is a senior English major at UC Berkeley, winner of the Fabili Hoffer Prize and the American Poet Prize. She facilitates a short story workshop through the Chernin program and loves to write short stories and poetry, which can all be found on her website, Alex Coppell, that's K-O-P-E-L dot wordpress dot com. Please welcome her. Thank you. Um, I'm going to be reading an excerpt from a short story I wrote called To You, Marcel. And it's a short story about um, the narrator who dates the ultimate fraud, Marcel. And in doing so, she becomes a fraud, and their relationship becomes a fraud. And I'm reading the climax and the end. So all I wanted to do was tell him to stop but couldn't because I was so afraid of shattering his glass ego. I knew the only way he would stop is if I faked an orgasm, so I just started screaming. Here I was, on his rug, shrieking, legs sprawled, as if I was birthing his psychotic demon child, his Heath Ledger muse, in excruciating pain. My screams were restless waves, rocking against the floor, reverberating around his ridiculous apartment, here was the performative climax of the role I had been playing for the last six months. I was screaming because I was so tired, tired of acting. I was clawing at his egotism, scratching at his fraudulence. I was crying for all the things I couldn't say, yelling for all the pain he had never known or would ever know he had caused me in his self-absorption. My cries echoed over and over again, plunging into a red sea, refusing to resurface for air. My shrieks were pleased to feel something, anything real. And as I continued to yell, I could feel the semblance of a genuine feeling emerging, a sensation that erupted and exploded into a reality that began to spread through me, a wave washing away my facade, flooding my body with pure emotion. My screams began to dissolve into this whirlpool of sensation, into a chorus of a self at harmony. And I could feel the sense of a finitely brief, infinitely calm relief, a sense of peace. And I stopped screaming. My inhales and exhales formed the rhythm of a song, the beat of a melody I had forgotten and now remembered. And I rested in this music of my breath, in this tumultuous silence of the ridiculous apartment, savoring my solitude. Well, damn, I guess you're welcome. 
I ignored Mar Marcel's texts, calls, and ignored him in class. One day, I was sitting in the main library of campus, a large, beautiful room that had long oak tables, high ceilings, and always made me feel as if I was in Hogwarts. I looked up from my computer screen and saw a man in a wizard robe and silver-tinted hair approach me, and for a split second, I thought, holy shit, is this Dumbledore giving me my letter in person? 10 years too late, but I'll take what I can get. I quickly realized that it wasn't Dumbledore. It wasn't even a wizard. Just Marcel in a magician's cape, freshly dyed metallic hair, and a new lip piercing. Hey, kitty cat, what you working on? A story. Is it about me? What an egotistical, self-absorbed prick. He wished my stories would center around him. I hope you put it on Facebook and it gets a lot of likes. He said with that half smile, that wink in his crazy green eyes, knowing exactly which buttons of mine to press. I hope you used your newfound wizardly powers to conjure up a nice little potion for your psycho psychopathic tendencies and eventually care about someone else. I didn't say, because he wasn't even worth my time, worth my words. I just turned my head to the screen and finished typing the sentence I was on, tying up the loose ends of the part he had cast me in, in the role I had willingly played, in the theater that housed our own artistic pursuits with an audience of only two to you, Marcel. Thank you. And um, the next reader is Samika Kumar. She's a student at Berkeley pursuing a major in cognitive science and a minor in creative writing. She enjoys writing fiction and is the editor-in-chief of Berkeley Byte, a student-run news blog for technology design and campus culture. Thank you. Uh, I'll be reading from a short story that I wrote for Melanie Abrams' class. In the evenings, Daddy and I continue to eat at the dining table with three placemats, three plates, three napkins. Daddy always served my sister Olivia's plate first. Her portions were returned back to the serving container after we finished. Then Daddy washed her plate with ours as if she had eaten with us and was already back inside her room finishing homework. The nights were long, tearful, and filled with shrieks of nightmares. The feelings I conceal during the day manifested during nightfall as ferocious, girl-eating monsters and zombies lurking under my bed, inside my closet, and behind Olivia's empty bed on the other side of the room. Daddy finally let me sleep in his bedroom. However, the comfort and security I was expecting felt absent. His quiet sobs shook the bed all night and made the floorboards creak. It was a sleepless night, but by the next evening, I had already learnt to make them my lullaby. Eight days after Olivia went missing, I found the plastic bag of bones under the front porch. I was practicing my golf swing on the lawn. In the end, I tried a small chip with an actual ball, and it rolled off the green, past the four rickety stairs that led to the front door, rolling, rolling, beneath the squeaky wooden planks of the porch, until it hit the house and stopped. I tried to pull the ball out with my club, but it was too far in. Finally, I had to crawl on all fours. Under the porch, it was the strange, musty odor that made my back tingle, reminiscent of a rotting cat that Olivia had found last year on our driveway and insisted on burying in our backyard, long after life had seeped from the cadaver and brought out its true scent. I forgot the lost ball and called Daddy, who had finally managed to take off time from work. That night, wearing rubber surgical gloves, he pulled out the bag, a large white garbage sack neatly double-knotted, and brought it to the garage. The knot was tight. He had to use scissors to cut it open. I watched him rip the bag's thick membrane irreparably apart. As he peered inside, the crevices beneath his cheekbones grew darker. He slowly pulled out a semicircular object, pale white like her skin, lined with dull, jagged pearls that, my chesty compressed, looked like teeth. Go into the house, Alice, his voice was hoarse. What is it? Go into the house. I floated into the house and sat in the corridor. Daddy telephoned Officer Willis, but I could barely hear his voice above the pounding of my heart. Within minutes, Officer Willis and a forensic pathologist arrived. Pressing my ear to the door, I tried to listen it to the deep voices echoing inside the garage. The forensic pathologist suggested taking the bones immediately back to the lab, but Officer Willis wanted to work in the scene of the crime. I tugged the door open an inch and peered inside. 
They had a dark blue tarp spread across the garage floor. The bag sat deflated at the edge of the mat. The bones were sprawled out in vertical rows that reminded me of church pews. A man wearing black gloves and uniform was kneeling on the mat, head bowed down, a bright lamp near his head, a long white appendage in his right hand. He set it down carefully beside a rectangular mass of curved white projections that, I squeezed my head further through the open door, looked like a rib cage. They were recreating the skeleton. Lying beside the ribcage, the skull had cracks along its rounded dome. The two eye sockets stared unblinkingly upward through the ceiling, a cold and empty attic, the roof, into a dark sky that I suddenly imagined was starless. Brown sinewy strands clung to its face like matted hair. The discs making up a spine formed pieces of a jagged arc. The pelvic girdle was snapped in half like the broken wings of a butterfly. Daddy stood in the corner, fingers covering his face. I wondered if he was watching. The bones were mostly clean, with the exception of a few smears and smudges that could have been dried flesh or blood. Three hours later, the remains lay in their proper sequence, helplessly and uncomfortably atop the tarp. Everything except for the feet and hands, which the pathologist said were made of too many tiny odds and ends, some of which were lost, broken. I knew it was Olivia once they set the bones in place. I could feel it. Every molecule of air was stained with her vanilla grapefruit scent from eight days before. Her cool fingers brushed against my skin. Her soft but confident voice la laughed in my ears. Suddenly, I couldn't feel the laundry room linoleum beneath my haunches, the molecules scattered before me, the deep throaty words, only her left femur is missing, formed dissonant chords that oscillated through my skull. One leg shorter than the other, with stubs where her fingers and toes should have been, how would she dance in heaven? After taking several photos, Officer Willis packed away Olivia's bones. For analysis, he said, to make sure it's really her. I shut the door, closed my eyes, counted one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three, as Olivia's particles grew diluted in the air around me, and I knew that they had taken her away for good. Thank you. Forty Stuer studied at Sarah Lawrence College before completing a BA in English at UC Berkeley. The author's work has been featured in Ada Magazine and Clam. Forty resides in the San Francisco Bay Area and is completing a book of short fiction and essays. Hi there. Um, I'd first like to thank everyone for setting this up. Um, I'd like to thank the Berkeley Connect program as well. Um, and most importantly, Georgina Klieg for taking a chance on me with um, nonfiction. Uh, and in general, um, and um, some of the fellow prize winners for working on this essay. So thank you, Donna and Natasha. If you're here, I can't find you. Um, anywho, this essay is called Object Permanence. Um, I used to catch salamanders when it rained. I'd give them water and dirt and feed them flies or ants before setting them free. I ran an equal opportunity catch and release program. Despite my efforts, they'd sometimes end up in a drought or a flood. I choose not to believe in the existence of pure evil, but every creature is born into and reacts to its unpredictable external factors, desires, compassion, and affection, and deserves, uh, oh, desires, compassion, affection, deserves it. I always begin from this assumption, no matter how quickly I forget it. I sense most do, though some forget more frequently than others. Like most people, my first memory was artificially manufactured. We went through the haunted mansion and waited in line until we hopped into a coffin that led us on a track through a dark, mechanized maze. At the very end, a holographic skeleton appeared between my mother and I in the mirror. I was enthralled and terrified and looked, ne uh, and looked next to me to see if the hologram was sitting there. It was sublime. It's an anachronism, of course, a prefabrication of memory. But every mind has to start building somewhere. Unlike most people, Herbert Mullen's first memory was clear fact. He was born on April 18th, 1947, the, date of the same date as the 1906 earthquake, to a middle-class Santa Cruz family. I was crawling on my hands and knees, Mullen recalls, and I was looking into a puddle, and I saw myself and the redwood trees reflected in the sunlight, and I touched the sun with my finger, and it created little circular waves extending outward in all directions. I felt peaceful and calm and inquisitive, curious, content, grateful, and hopeful. Preschool started with a gouging betrayal. I came to Notre Dame Montessori with my only friend, Brett. 
My mother likely selected the school, asserting the developmental benefits of constructivist education. The first day, he publicly renounced our friendship, leaving me cold in the tan bark. This made several carpools tense. We'd snake up the narrow road in silence until we reached the church's spires and turrets. Then the doors would close, in, close us in. I would feel the type of childish alienation bound by the ultimate dread, lack of foresight. But the day I learned to cut an apple, I felt a rush of control and accomplishment. Equally, I feared cutting myself, or worse, somebody else. Cupcake, Cuppy Shore, was the first cat I knew. I loved cats. They were warm, heavy, stuffed creatures. Except they crawled out of their clothes and I couldn't fit accessories in their hands. And of course they moved. But not like the remote control car or a wind-up toy. They moved when I wanted them to stay still. So I'd reach for the tail as she moved away. Something I did with the, uh, all the time with toys. I'd get frustrated and pull harder and they'd yell. My mom had to explain that cats feel and to some degree think. Eventually, after many scars, I learned the limits of her play value, particularly geography. I just learned how to use scissors and started making collages in preschool. I pawed over glossy photos for past, for, from past months' People magazines, which usually circulated between the beach house and my mom's waiting room. I started cutting around a group of frizzy-haired women who appeared furious against a Florida panhandle sunset, or possibly sunrise. They might have had pitchforks and torches. They held signs that, at four, I can even even I could read clearly. Fry, Bundy, Fry. It seemed other mothers disliked married with children, but Fry, didn't that seem a tad vicious? We were living in Saratoga, and my grandmother Justine at the time, uh, with my grandmother Justine at the time while our house was being remodeled. In the years before preschool, Justine took, of me, took care of me while my parents both worked and my brothers were in school. She, she read to me a great deal. Uh, she would read to me a great deal, play, piano, nap, watch movies, do crafts, paint faces, play with the cats. Imagine it was a relief for her. She had recently lost a little collie and several years prior the slow loss of her husband to Alzheimer's. It's only now that I can feel how concentrated it was in her, how it informed her actions but was never reflected in them. They never did say why they bought the beach house in Aptos. To this day, beyond tax breaks, it still isn't explicit. They moved around a dozen times in the past decade. My parents worked efficiently throughout the 1980s, alternating between child and degree rearing. After they'd received two of each, they moved down to Saratoga and had me. I sense it's relatively simple. They wanted breaks in general. Breaks in the cycle, breaks from ourselves, each other, breakings of bread and bunk beds. The wave breaks of Seacliff Beach and the breaks that supported our car every weekend driving along the world's most dangerous highway, 17, into what was known in the 1970s, then unbeknownst to us, as the murder capital of the world. Mullen grew up within a well-adjusted, well-regulated nuclear family in Placid Felton, a small town nestled between mountains and redwoods in the Santa Cruz Mountains. His father was a World War II veteran who playfully boxed with his sons and recounted violent, violent tales of heroism. His father taught him how to hunt at a young age. Mullen was popular, a football player with a steady girlfriend, Christian, and an honor student who had been voted most likely to succeed. He had a full scholarship to attend San Jose State when he heard the news of the death of his best friend and became severely unstable. My mom picked me up that afternoon and it was pretty hot for October. I was in the car seat, Leonardo and Donatello in fighting poses beside me. Most of my friends weren't mobile. My grandmother was more or less stationary, as was Cuppy. I remember nap time earlier that day where I laid down on my separate mat. I picked up Leonardo and Donatello and they fought despite their shared affiliation. I'd been seeing a lot of that in the playground. I thought it was just my brothers who fought, which my mom and dad had said was a sign they loved each other. It didn't feel like love. When we picked Matt and Alex up from school, they switched the radio on to hear the beginning of the A's game. My mom went to take us to a shopping because, well, it was Tuesday and maybe there was a sale. We went to a Best Showroom in Campbell. Best Products built stores as a postmodern promotional campaign throughout the 1970s. It gave us box stores with peeling facades, glass atriums, and structures buried underneath strips of highway. Some facades opened as suicide doors and some portending bankruptcy, appeared to be crumbling. But this was just a box store. We walked through the sliding doors into a foreign marketplace. Everything was branded in cartoonish letters. Shelves loomed over me as, uh, on either side as we stared down some of the aisles. We went to the electronic section, which had a multicast of the World Series across uh, a wall of television, uh, televisions. The adjacent aisle was the video section, which transitioned to the toy section on the next aisle. 
My mother let go of my hand to go barter with Matt over a set of micro machines. I stood at the edge of the aisle and a set of colorful videos at a point of sale display caught my eye. The covers were lurid, each containing colorful airbrushed art. One depicted an ethereal spirit in a graveyard. Another showed a group of teenagers walking along knife blades. Another had a girl screaming in bed and sh another showed a melted man with a hat like my dad wore. They all shared one thing, claws that seemed to jut forward and pierce through the cover. It let her recognize these boxes stuffed with styrofoam lurking in the deepest recesses of every video store we ever went to. Maybe I could get one today since it was Halloween when I was allowed to be scared. The ground began to vibrate as if a plane flew by and r the rumble mounted. The television wall flickered to black. The whole store shook. Windows rippled and warped and the shelves lurched viol violently as the lights flickered and swung loose, falling behind each of us. My mother pushed Matt ahead and grabbed my hand, pulling me forward. Display cases shattered around us. Boxes fell overhead. People ran frantically as they crouched and ducked. An employee had forced open the doors. Stock toppled from the shelves as we ran to the exits. I tripped and my mother dragged me forward. I looked back. My brothers dodged falling boxes. We stood in the parking lot, waiting for the store to move again. They were called aftershocks. I could feel the, my scraped knee, the blood pressure, but no pain. It wasn't until Matt reached for the door handle that he realized he had shoplifted. At the moment of shock, his hand clutched the package of miniature cars as a sympathetic reflex. Though my mom considered taking it back, it seemed processing returns wouldn't be top priority. She, stared, she uh, started the paneled station wagon. We laughed hysterically because it was all we could do to escape the dread of aftershocks. Noticeably afraid, she took her time, and we took back roads. Even though I'm the last one, I guess I'll end there. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>